Welcome back to this Theology Matters course on the Gospels in Comparison. This is session four, and here we'll turn our attention to the Gospel of Matthew. And once again, we'll be focusing in on some of the most distinctive features of this presentation of Jesus and the disciples. We already noted uh, that uh, Matthew, at a few points in our previous session, and we compared how he framed certain topics, particularly the topic of discipleship, differently than Mark. And here we'll do this a little bit more thoroughly and systematically. Uh, we'll look mostly in this session at Mark's relationship, uh, or Matthew's relationship to Mark, and then in our next session, we'll compare Matthew to Luke. So here we're looking at Matthew in comparison to Mark. In the next session, we'll look at Luke in comparison to Matthew. So once again, I want to start with some very mundane matters about length and style of Matthew's presentation of this gospel. The first and most obvious thing to note is that, uh, and this doesn't take a Master's of Divinity degree or a PhD, Matthew is longer than Mark. Uh, There's 16 chapters in Mark versus 28 chapters in Matthew. I did the math. This is the sort of thing like an ex-chemistry major does uh, when he turns into the humanities. I actually calculate these things. Matthew is 62% longer uh, than Mark, so it's a good bit longer. Um, Mark has 11,000 words. Matthew has about 18,000 uh, a little shy of 19. Um, so we might ask here, well, what does Matthew add? Where, where do these extra chapters and words come from? What does he add? Well, first of all, some of the added material uh, is unique to Matthew. That is, these are things that Matthew adds that are not found in Luke, they're not found in John, and they're not found in Mark. They're very unique to him. Uh, and Matthew does add a lot of unique things, about 380 verses. Uh, again, I counted. Uh, the, the expansions are especially at the beginning, Right? Matthew has this, in comparison to Mark, Matthew has this long beginning where he gives this great genealogy of Jesus' ancestors, and that leads right into um, an announcement of Jesus' birth to Joseph, a nativity scene, the Magi, the star. All of these different things are happening in Matthew that have no parallel in Mark. So there's an expanded beginning. There's also an expanded ending. We'll think about in our last session together Mark's very abrupt ending, and I'll unpack what that means. Uh, later, but suffice it to say for now, uh, in Matthew, there's much more material uh, when it comes to Jesus' crucifixion and also his resurrection, his post-resurrection experiences to the disciples. So that's, uh, that accounts for some of the added material, beginning stuff, end stuff. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the added material also comes in the form of these sayings, kind of teachings that Jesus gives. Now, I alluded to this in the second session uh, where we noted that Matthew and Mark um, draw on this other source. So there's this other theoretical source out there called Q for German quella, meaning source or writing. And it seems that Matthew and Mark know of this other source. In addition to looking at Mark, um, Matthew is looking at this other source and is drawing on these, all of these sayings from Jesus that come from this so-called Q source. Now, the majority of these sayings that Matthew used uses uh, come in the form of five lengthy sections where Jesus gives long, uh, I want to say sermons, but in this context, I, w- I might want to say long lectures that go over the time that they were allotted for. Uh, so it, there's five blocks of additional teaching material in the Gospel of Matthew. They're in chapters 5 through 7. That's the Sermon on the Mount, by the way, 5 through 7. You probably are familiar with some of that material. Um, uh, they're the blessed are you statements. There's the antitheses. We'll talk about some of this stuff later. Uh, so there's that famous block, but then there's four other blocks of teaching materials. Uh, and this is why if you, I don't know if any of you have those red letter Bibles where everything Jesus says is in red. How many of you have that? Well, if you have that, just kind of look at Mark and then look at Matthew. There's a lot more read in Matthew than in Mark, and the reason for that is that you have these lengthy sermons or lectures in Matthew that are just not there in the Gospel of Mark. Now, what's interesting, because of these, uh, that, that there are five of these, it has led some to think that these fl- five blocks of teaching are an attempt to parallel the five first books of the Old Testament that we know as the Pentateuch. Uh, So there's supposed to be kind of a parallel here. And this parallel, uh, we we can't be sure that this is what Matthew had in mind, but it's possible. And one of the reasons we think this is possible is because in the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, and you can kind of see it here in this famous picture of the Sermon on the Mount, where does Jesus give the Sermon on the Mount? Well, 
the title kind of gives it away, right? He gives it on a mount. So he climbs up to this mountaintop. He sits down to teach his disciples. Well, some scholars think, again, that's an intentional parallel to Moses going up to Mount Sinai to receive the law. So some think that Matthew is kind of mirroring what Moses did to receive the law. Now it's Jesus going up to the top of the mountain to teach people these things. Um, now, there are a couple other nice literary touches in the Gospel of Mark. We kind of mentioned before that Mark was a little bit choppy, a little bit less sophisticated. Matthew's Greek and kind of the way he structures his narrative is much more refined, and there's some cool ways in which it's, defi- which it's refined. Just one of them I want to give your attention to, it's a very quick example, is, is a literary technique called inclusio. That just means bracketing, that you start the story with one theme, and then you end the story with the same exact theme. So there's kind of like an envelope. So there's a beginning and the end mirror each other. And I want to show you how Matthew does it. I think it's pretty cool. Um, There are brackets. Well, in the beginning of the story, uh, we have this famous line, uh, look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel. Now, in Hebrew, Emmanuel means, and the text gives us this, God is with us. So there's this announcement about something about Jesus' nature. He's the Emmanuel. He is the God with us. Now, what's so interesting is that Matthew has framed the beginning of his narrative with this, but Matthew's very final words echo the same theme. Matthew ends in the Great Commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, and I'm skipping ahead a little bit, and remember, now this is Jesus speaking, I am with you. Jesus says, basically, Emmanuel. I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Mark, or excuse me, Matthew's very last word that he places on Jesus' lips echoes that very first word that the angel reveals about who this Jesus is to be. Uh, it's a great literary uh, flourish in many ways. Luke thus frames his gospel in terms of God's presence. The God who is with us, in the, or is God who is with uh, Jesus uh, in his birth is the God who is with the church as it goes forth into the world to make disciples. That is a connection I think Matthew is inviting us to make, and it's it's a result of his literary style. So enough for length and style. I want to turn to a couple other different uh, distinctives about Matthew, and these first couple will have to do with how Matthew presents Jesus. It's the same Jesus, right? I want to say that, that Matthew and Mark are talking about the same person, but how they present that person, what they emphasize, the aspects of Jesus' ministry that, that are they're foregrounded in Matthew, are not the same as in Mark. And I'll show you a couple examples of that. Um, One example, oops, is that in Mark's, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus is described as a forgiver of sins. Now, of course, we know that uh, Jesus is associated with the forgiveness of sins. That's true in all of the gospels, all of the New Testament, in fact. But Matthew emphasizes this point far more than Mark. And this is very easy to miss, but, but, take, out, but take a look at some of these examples. Um, in the announcement of Jesus' birth, in that extended introduction that Matthew gives us, uh, the angel n- tells uh, Joseph, here the angel is addressing Joseph, and he tells Joseph what to name the child. She will bear a son, meaning Mary, and you are to name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Now, that seems very obvious to us. We know that Jesus is here to save sins, but that part's left out of Mark. It's not that Mark thinks uh, Jesus doesn't forgive sins, but Mark excludes it, and Matthew makes this point. Okay, It comes up in other places. Interestingly enough, think about how uh, Mark and Matthew frame John the Baptist's ministry. Here's what Mark says. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Okay, simple enough. We probably could have guessed that about John the Baptist. But look at how Matthew announces the beginning of John's ministry. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea proclaiming, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. What has Matthew left out? For the forgiveness of sins. Matthew wants to say, that forgiveness, that's only something that Jesus does. Whereas Mark includes that as part of John's ministry. Here's the one that I think really uh, cinches it. It's in the Last Supper, where we have those words of institution that we say every time we have communion. Listen to the difference between Mark and Matthew. Jesus said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, 
which is poured out for many. That's Mark, okay? Listen to how Matthew says it. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. So always Matthew is emphasizing Jesus' role and mission as a one who forgives sin. Now, why does Matthew make this emphasis as opposed to Mark? Well, uh, more than any other gospel, Matthew is concerned about instruction, instructing the church. Indeed, Matthew, believe it or not, Matthew is the only gospel that uses the word church, that uses the word ecclesia. John and, and, and Luke and Mark never use the word church, but Matthew does, because from the beginning, Matthew is trying to instruct the early church on how to live out this life of faith uh, in Jesus, the Son of God. Uh, in Matthew, the identity and mission of the church, in fact, is rooted in and is a response to God's forgiveness. Now, again, I want to stress that if Matthew told that to Mark and Luke and John, I don't think they would disagree. Uh, but this point comes out much more clearly in Matthew's gospel than it does in all of the others. I'll give you another example of this, kind of how Matthew and Mark differ. So I've already said that in Matthew, you've got these huge chunks of red letter, this red letter stuff that Matthew adds, where Jesus is just off teaching. He's teaching, 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 teaching. In fact, I would go so far as to say that the characteristic activity of Jesus in Matthew is teaching. But there's a big but here. What is so interesting is that even though in Matthew, Jesus is always teaching, Matthew, uh, in, in Matthew, Jesus is very rarely called teacher. So he teaches all the time, but he's very rarely called teacher. In Mark, Jesus is always called teacher, right? In Mark, uh, the, Jesus' disciples call him teacher. People he meets and heals call him teacher. Even Jesus' foes uh, in Mark call him teacher. But in Matthew, Matthew goes through Mark. He takes all those stories where people call uh, Jesus teacher, and he systematically edits it. Let me give you a couple examples, and I'll tell you why I think this is happen happening. So, here's one example. Uh, it's the Gospel of Mark. Uh, it's a case where, um, where are we here? Oh, yeah, that's right. A father of a demon-possessed boy seeks Jesus' help. Um, and in doing so, he dresses Jesus as teacher. So Mark gives us the story. Teacher, speaking to Jesus, I, bought, I brought you my son. He is a spirit that makes him unable to speak. Matthew has the same story, but look at what he does. Lord, not teacher, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and he suffers terribly. A change from teacher to Lord. Um, and this happens all of the time. Matthew systematically goes through. And every time a disciple in Mark or a follower of Jesus in Mark calls Jesus teacher, Matthew changes it to Lord. Okay, he's very careful about this. There's one place where Ma Matthew does not change Mark, uh, Mark's story where a disciple calls Jesus teacher. And that exception proves the rule. Here it is, Mark 14, 45. So when Jesus came, Judas went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, that's the Hebrew word for teacher. It means my great one. Rabbi, and he kissed him. Here's Matthew's version. At once Judas came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. What's going on here? What's going on? Well, um, who calls Jesus teacher in Matthew? Well, it's Judas but it's also the scribes, the Pharisees, the tax collectors, the Herodians, the Sadducees. Basically, those who encounter Jesus and reject him call him teacher. Those who encounter Jesus and accept him call him Lord. Mark doesn't make a distinction, but Matthew makes this very fine distinction uh, about who calls him teacher and who calls him Lord. So what's going on here? I think he, this is Matthew's point. Jesus is not just another rabbi. He's not just another good teacher down the street that you go and listen to and learn some interesting stuff and think, boy, that guy put together a good sermon. That was a nice message. That was a nice uh, thing that he had to say about X, Y, and Z. Matthew wants to say, this is not just another teacher. Jesus is the risen Lord. And to follow him, 
To truly follow Jesus, in Matthew's view, means to not just think of him as a, as a sage, as a teacher, as a wise man, but rather to confess him as the risen Lord. And so that's why the disciples never called Jesus teacher, other than this one case with, with Judas. And that, again, is kind of the exception that proves the rule. This shows us that Judas never got it, right? The fact that he's still here at the Last Supper is calling Jesus rabbi means that he never got it. He never truly was a follower. So an interesting difference then in Matthew and Mark. Um, okay, let me switch to another topic. I'm going to circle back. In our, in our last session, we talked about Mark. We talked about the failure of the disciples. Well, the disciples have their fair share of mistakes in the Gospel of Matthew as well. But I would argue that the disciples have a significant makeover. It's Disciples 2.0 when we get to Matthew. And this kind of makeover is a result, again, of Matthew going through and very systematically editing Mark to make the disciples look better. And I kind of want to walk you through a couple examples that I think really uh, make this very clear. And this is one of those things, by the way, that if you're not reading the Gospels in parallel, <clears throat> excuse me, it's almost impossible to detect these differences, right? Because you just like, you know the story or you're not even thinking about which Gospel it comes from. It's only when you actually start putting the stories, <clears throat> excuse me, right next to each other, when you compare them word for word, then these differences just jump off the page. And it's hard not to see them, but, but you have to kind of do some cutting and pasting in order to catch it. So um, I want to do a couple examples. Actually, a couple examples cluster around this set of stories where uh, the disciples are in a boat and a storm kinks, kicks up on the water and they're fearful that they're gonna be, their boat's going to be flooded and then Jesus calms the wind and the waves, right? Do you all familiar with that story a little bit? There's actually two versions of it. Mark gives it twice and Matthew gives it twice and there's a little difference between the two and I actually want to look at those two stories of a similar sort of event as examples of the disciples' makeover. So, in the first case, in the first case that we'll look at at least, Jesus is with the disciples. So the disciples are out in a boat. Jesus is with them in the boat. A storm kicks up, and Jesus is in the back falling asleep. Right? He's asleep, and the disciples are thinking, what is going on? The storm is going to sink our boat, and there is our Savior in the back falling asleep. Uh, and so in Mark, here's what happens. Um, in Mark, the disciples wake Jesus up, and they say, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Like, why are you asleep? This is insane. We're about to die here. So the disciples are saying, don't you care that we're perishing? Well, in Matthew, same thing happens. The disciple, Jesus is still asleep in Matthew. The disciples go to him, but now look at what the disciples say. The disciples say, not teacher, right? So don't say teacher, right? Because you now know that in Matthew, the disciples don't say teacher. They say, Lord, right? Another great example of that. They don't say, do you not care? They say, Lord, save us. They say, Lord, save us, we are perishing. Uh, that in Hebrew would have been something like, Lord, Hosanna, save now, save us in this situation. What's the difference between the two in your, in your reading of this? One's accusatory, the other is a prayer. That's right, one's accusatory, and one assumes that Jesus can save them and does care. The disciples assume Jesus cares Jesus can save them, and so they're now they're just praying, Hosanna, come save us. And the disciples in Mark don't get it. They think that Jesus is just going to sleep through it and doesn't care, right? An amazing difference here. Um, at the end of this very same story, we say uh, there's actually another really interesting uh, difference. So um, at the end of the story in Mark, Mark, this is Mark 4, Jesus says to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? Now, in the end, the, the faith of the disciples in Matthew also wavers, but note again this subtle difference. Jesus said to them, Why are you afraid, you of little faith? To be of little faith is something different than be of no faith. And in from Mark to Matthew, we go from no faith to little faith. There's still some work to be done in the lives of the disciples in Matthew, but there's a different starting point. Now, let me, uh, let me go on to a, the second version of this story. I couldn't resist this picture, right? There are a lot of Legos in my house right now. Uh, I step on a lot of Legos in my house right now. So I found this one about Jesus helping Peter up out of the water, uh, and I couldn't resist to use it uh, in Lego form. We do not have this set at home, 
by the way. Uh, I've not found it at Target. I found a lot of Batman and Superman, but not this one. Um, so the other story of Jesus calming the storm is a little bit different. In this case, the disciples are out in the boat. Jesus is on the shore, so he's not with them when the storm kicks up. There's actually there are two versions of this. And in the second version, Jesus walks on the water to get to the disciples in the boat because he's not with them. So he's not asleep, but he's away somewhere else, and he walks on the water to get to them. And I guess uh, we're, we're seeing a little bit ahead in this, in this picture here. So notice this difference. This difference. In Mark, uh, sorry, it's a little bit small there, but in Mark uh, 652, um, Jesus calms the storm again, and what do the disciples uh, what happens? They were utterly astonished, for they did not understand about the loaves, and their hearts were hardened. So this is kind of a reference to a previous story. So the disciples don't get it, they're astonished, they see that Jesus calmed the winds, and they just think, What has happened? Well, look at how the story in Matthew ends. And those in the boat worshipped him and said, Truly you are the Son of God. The very thing the disciples never can utter in Mark is what the disciples say here in the boat. And they don't say, they're not astonished. They worship. They get who has just calmed the wind and the rain. A very, very different portrait of the disciples in the, in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, there's many, many other examples uh, th- that we might give of this. Um, I'll give you one more. Uh, in, in, I mentioned earlier in our previous uh, session that when Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to die, he makes these announcements where he says he's going to be, suffer and be persecuted and so on and so forth. Um, and, uh, and so often in the Gospel of Mark, the, the disciples just don't get it. Jesus would say that, and, and the disciples did not understand what he was saying, and they were afraid to ask him about it. Right, the disciples are kind of this like, uh, they just, it just doesn't click for them, right? They're even, they're even afraid to clarify. Well, in the same story in the Gospel of Matthew, it just says that the disciples were greatly distressed. They get what's happening. They get that Jesus is going to suffer and die, and it distresses them, but they understand that's part of the mission of the Messiah. So a very different portrait of what the disciples are like. Now, I have to stress again that in Matthew, disciples are not perfect, but Matthew's presentation is definitely more positive. Now, again, we have to ask why. Why would Matthew give the disciples a makeover? Well, I think, again, a lot has to do with how the gospel of Matthew ends. Remember, we've already seen it in miniature, but uh, the gospel of Matthew ends with, with what some people call the Great Commission, this commission of the disciples to go out into the world. It ends this way, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to, to obey everything that I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you always. That's that Emmanuel that we saw earlier. I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus here is commissioning the disciples to be his ambassadors in the world, to, be, to represent his authority. Um, and to, if this is the role of the disciples in the church, then we need a better picture of disciples. We need disciples who get it. We need disciples who can understand precisely because they have been tasked to teach, to be the mouthpiece of God as the gospel goes out throughout the world. So I think Matthew has, has needed to upgrade the disciples in part because he knows what they're going to be commissioned to do. And of course, Mark does not end in this commission. Mark ends very differently, as we'll see in the last session of this course. So that's a little bit about the depiction of the disciples. Let me move um, really to one last but very important topic, and it has to do with Jesus and the Old Testament. How Jesus relates to the Old Testament is very, very different in the Gospel of Matthew than in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, In fact, one of the distinctive features of the Gospel of Matthew is how often the writer, or Jesus, uh, quotes the Old Testament. It's hard sometimes to, to, to figure out what counts as a quotation of the Old Testament, but a reasonable guess is that there are about 57 quotations of the Old Testament in the Gospel of Matthew. There are far, far, far fewer than that in the Gospel of Mark. So there's just a lot more Old Testament in Matthew than in Mark. Um, and in addition to that, almost every time the, uh, the Old Testament is cited in the Gospel of Matthew, it comes with this little formula. It's kind of introduced with this stock phrase. And Matthew's always saying, this was to fulfill what had been spoken. And then you give the Old Testament 
uh, citation or, or, or quotation. Um, for instance, uh, when an angel appears to Joseph um, and tells the Holy Family to flee to Egypt um, because Herod is looking to kill Jesus, when he says that, the text says, this was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. Out of Egypt I have called my son. So what's Matthew doing here? How do we understand this? I think Matthew is not necessarily saying, and this quote, by the way, is from uh, the prophet Hosea, hundreds and hundreds of years earlier. I don't think Matthew is saying Hosea was prophesying Jesus. I don't think that's exactly what Matthew meant. He might have thought that. But I think what Matthew is doing is something a little bit more general. I think he's saying, uh, because the, I should say in the original context of Hosea, uh, it's clear that the son here is Israel. Hosea is recounting the story of how God brought Israel out of Egypt in the Exodus. So in the case of Hosea, out of Egypt I have called my son, the son is Israel. Matthew knows that. Matthew knows his Old Testament. Uh, but here he's linking this Old Testament passage to something that's happened in Jesus' life for a very explicit reason. It's as if Matthew is saying, by knowing, only by knowing Jesus can we fully understand the Old Testament. And only by owning, uh, fully understanding the Old Testament can we truly understand who this Jesus is. So in Matthew, Jesus' life and teaching and even his death and resurrection are bathed in Old Testament quotations so as to see this continuity between the old and the new. Of course, they weren't called the old and the new back then. There are labels. It was just Israel's scripture. It was Bible. Uh, but what, would be, what this New Testament would become through Matthew was intricately connected to the Israelite scriptures. Uh, so he, but he's doing a little bit more than this. It's not just that there's all these citations. Uh, in Matthew, Jesus is presented as an authoritative interpreter of the Old Testament. So it's not just that he's quoting the Old Testament, but Matthew is routinely shows Jesus that he has the authority to interpret Scripture correctly. And this place, this is this uh, observation is nowhere more clear than in the Sermon on the Mount. And there's this part in the Sermon on the Mount called the Antitheses. There's six of these. It's Matthew uh, 21 through 57. Um, and, and this will, I, I suspect that this will sound a little bit uh, familiar. Here's how the Antitheses go. It begins always by saying, you have heard it said, and then there's some quotation, some idea, and then Jesus says, but I say to you. So this is where the antithetical nature of, of the quote. So you've heard this, you've heard one thing, but I'm going to tell you another thing. Um, so here's a long example. This is just one of them. You've heard it, that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder. Now that's a quotation of the Decalogue of the Ten Commandments, uh, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift on the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Now there's two things to note here. What is Jesus doing? With respect to the law, you shall not murder. What is Jesus doing? He's obviously interpreting it, but, but what direction is his, his interpretation going? Is he, is he making it easier? Yeah, he's expanding it. He's making it more diff difficult. I can't tell you how often I hear in Christian circles, Jesus abolishes the law, Jesus, grace replaces law, so on and so forth. Here, Jesus is making the law harder. Jesus is both internalizing the law and intensifying it. He's saying, look, it's not enough just to not murder your brother or sister. Even if you, um, even, even hating your brother and sister, right? even if there, there's no uh, physical harm, that's a violation of the commandment. So Jesus here, as this authoritative interpreter of Torah or, or of the Old Testament law, he's saying, you haven't gone far enough. You haven't gone far far enough. That's where he's, Jesus is exercising his authority. So that's one point. Now, the second point is a little bit easier to miss, but I, but I think it's important here. Um, and here I need to tell a little bit of a backstory. In rabbinic Judaism, that's kind of like the normative mainline Judaism of Jesus' day, but also of the you know, centuries after Jesus. In rabbinic Judaism, um, it was unprecedented to say, but I tell you when you interpret. 
uh, that is, in, in rabbinic Judaism, the way you claimed authority was actually not by saying you think something, but by always quoting someone else, usually someone else older than you. Uh, there was this great story about a famous rabbi named Rabbi Hillel. He went off to Babylon for training and finally came back after years of training. And he was with other uh, rabbis, uh, and they were discussing a difficult text. And Rabbi Hillel says, here's what I think it means. And the rabbis grabbed him, and they threw him out. And then he comes back to them later and talking about another difficult text. And Rabbi Hillel says, here's what I think it means. And they grab him, and they throw him out of their house. And then finally, because things happen in threes, um, finally Rabbi Hillel comes back, and they're talking about another difficult text. And Rabbi Hillel says, I heard it from my teacher, who heard it from his teacher, who heard it from his teacher, who heard it from his teacher, who heard it from Moses on Mount Sinai. And then he gave the same interpretation, and they accepted it. Right? That was the standard in rabbinic Judaism. What's Jesus doing? But I say to you, he is claiming to be the absolute authority in a way that would have been utterly unthinkable in rabbinic Judaism. So it's not just that there's Old Testament quotations, but Jesus here is taking up an authoritative stance, both because he's intensifying the law, but also because he's claiming, I don't need to quote someone else. I'm the person you quote, right? So he doesn't have to do the thing that Rabbi Hillel did. Finally, I'm going to add one other layer to it. It's not just that that Matthew quotes a lot of Old Testament. It's not just that Matthew's Jesus uh, is uh, an authoritative interpreter of the Old Testament. But throughout Matthew's gospel, Jesus actually becomes a personification of the Old Testament. And there's a couple different places where this happens. Um, There's this one text in Matthew 12 where Jesus says, I'm greater than Solomon. I'm greater than Jonah. Right? And he's saying, I'm greater than than these aspects uh, of the Old Testament. Another place, um, and I wish I had more time to unpack this, Um, But there's that line in Matthew, do you remember this? It's kind of near the end, uh, where Jesus says, For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Do you remember that? Or I'm with you there, sometimes how it's translated, right? What's Jesus saying? Well, it's this nice thing where when two or three of us are gathered, Jesus is in our presence. Well, we know Jesus is with us when we're alone, too. So, So why is Matthew saying whenever two or three are gathered? Well, because Matthew knows Judaism. And he knows the tradition of rabbinic Judaism that says, Whenever two or three are gathered to study Torah, God's presence is with them. And so now Matthew knows that tradition and says, it's not when two or three are gathered to study Torah. It's when two or three are gathered to worship Jesus. Then God's presence is with them. Again, Matthew is kind of replacing Torah, Old Testament, uh, with uh, with Jesus in a way that might lead us to say that Jesus is personifying Torah. So, I want to say one last thing, and it has to do with this idea of Jesus in the Old Testament. And this will be our conclusion for this session. It is very common to say, whether you're in a Sunday school class or have one of those study Bibles uh, or anything like that, it's very common to read that Matthew is the most Jewish of the Gospels. How many of you heard that, say, you know, comparison to others? Matthew is the Jewish Gospel. Well, that's right, but it's also mostly not right. Um, or at least it's not, it doesn't go far enough. And I want to say two things about it that hopefully helps you understand the context for Matthew's gospel in the first place. On the one hand, it's not right to say that Matthew is a Jewish gospel because Mark is also very Jewish. There's nothing less Jewish about Mark's gospel in comparison to Matthew. They both draw, now Mark quotes the Old Testament a little bit less, but the symbolic world of Mark, what he's dealing with, what he's assuming, is as Jewish as as Matthew's gospel. So it's not right to say that, that Matthew is somehow the only Jewish gospel. Mark is also very Jewish. But there's another aspect of this phrase that I would want to massage a little bit, because the odd thing about Matthew is, despite all of its Old Testament references, despite its kind of Jewishness about how it presents Jesus, Matthew's gospel is more critical of the Jewish leaders than any other gospel. So the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they, uh, they are far more sharply critiqued in Matthew than any other gospel. So why would the most Jewish gospel be the most antagonistic to the Jews, right? That, that's usually not explained in, in these, uh, these kind of brief introductory study Bibles. Well, here's what I think and, and what scholars think um, is going on. 
What this suggests is that Matthew was writing to a community that was absolutely in contact with Judaism, but was trying to define itself, define itself over and against the mainline Pharisaical Judaism. Matthew's gospel happens uh, within a decade or so after the fall of the temple. And after the temple falls, um, Jewish Christians began to diverge more sharply from uh, Jews who weren't followers of Jesus. So these both groups came from the same Judaism. And at one point early in Jesus' life, uh, Jewish Christians were still part of the Jewish movement. They were just Jews who followed Jesus. But after the destruction of the temple, it became no longer, or it became less and less possible to be a follower of Jesus and be in the main line of Judaism. So Jewish Christians begin to diverge from kind of mainline Judaism. And what we think is that Matthew writes to that Jewish Christian group to say, look, you are still authentically Jewish. This is Jesus the Messiah. He is the son of Abraham. He, he, all of these symbols of Judaism still apply to you, and yet there's something different. And yet Jesus is uh, the personification of Torah. Jesus is the authoritative interpreter of Torah. So it's appropriating the symbols of Judaism, but making a claim that, that this type of Judaism, the Christian Judaism of Matthew's uh, audience, was the true, authentic Judaism. And we, and we think that this is going on um, because of things Matthew says, but also from other things. Uh, there's this famous Jewish prayer uh, that was originally called the 18 Benedictions. At the same time that, G that the Gospel of Matthew was written, a 19th benediction is added to the 18 others. And that 19th benediction calls upon curses upon, uh, calls curses upon heretics. Well, what heretics do they mean? The Jewish followers of Jesus. So Matthew's beginning to differentiate his Jewish community from the mainline, even as the mainline tradition is starting to recognize that these Jewish Christians are heretics. So there's a splitting of those two communities. And it's into that context that we, that we engage Matthew's gospel. Um, I'll give you one little case, one last thing. I promise this will be the end. I'll give you one. I probably said that before. Um, don't believe me. But this really is the end. Um, there's one other instance where we see kind of this tension between were the true Jews uh, or were the true followers of God, um, were Jewish and were Christian, and not them. There's this little story um, where uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees are coming to John the Baptist for John the Baptist for baptism. This is in Matthew 3, 9. Um, and uh, Jesus sees them coming, and he says this. Do not presume to say to yourselves. This is not in any other gospel, by the way. This is distinct Matthew stuff. So you know that he's trying to do something here. He says, do not presume to say to yourselves, this is the Pharisees and Sadducees, we have Abraham as our ancestor. Right? He's saying, don't just think that because you're Jewish by birth, that that's all you need. Right? Then Jesus follows and he says, For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children of Abraham. Now you have to remember that in mainline Judaism, to claim that you were a child of Abraham signified that you were part of the in-group, that you were truly, truly Jew Jewish. And what Jesus is saying is, God is able from these stones to raise up children of Abraham. Now, there's this wonderful play on word. We must remember that Jesus is speaking in Aramaic. And, uh, which is closely related to Hebrew. And the word for, uh, in Aramaic for stones is abanim. But the word for children in Aramaic is banim. So what Jesus is saying, this wonderful play of words, is from these abanim, I can raise up true banim, true descendants of Abraham. You can imagine the kind of this, how this falls within a Jewish Christian community who has been now more systematically excluded from mainline Judaism. Matthew's message is, it doesn't matter if you are children of Abraham, because through Christ, through faith, one can be grafted in to this line of promise. Even these stones can become children of Abraham. This is Matthew's message. It's a message of inclusion, but it's also a message that retains the symbols and ideas of Judaism. Thank you.